need to ask God, how best can I love a person by our words and actions? In our workplace, in our church, you don't want to get away from people. I have done that in the past, but I have repented and I have turned back. And I presume that you will also do the same thing. You might have somebody in your workplace, in your church, for some reason you have got a hatred or you have got a favoritism, either by rejecting that person or avoiding that person. Let this moment be the time that you want to build up a relationship. Ask God to reveal where you may be guilty of favoritism and partiality, showing partiality. And at the same time, ask for the discernment to make good distinctions about how to love, whom to trust, and when to comfort. Gracious God, we have thank you for this time. Lord, you speak the message. Let that words get etched into our hearts and minds and soul. And let us always follow those instructions and help us to lead the life according to your words, according to your will, not by our will, it is your will. Help us to surrender everything and listen to your words. You speak the part, we hear it. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. 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 We have been looking into the book of James. Before we go further for today's study, we we'll try to refresh what we did study for the previous days and then we will be going into the new section for today. As we all know, like the overall theme of the book of James is real faith produces work, under which we saw in the first chapter that real faith produces genuine stability. In the first chapter, we read more about and we dealt more about what James was mentioning about the practical themes in our life, how to endure the tests and the temptations in chapter 1 from verse 2 to 8. And the struggle between the rich and the poor in verses 9 to 11 how we need to be authentic words of the words of God, which we saw in the first chapter of 22 to 20. And how we need to guard our tongues, saw in verse 26 of the first chapter. And how to invest in those who would never pay. That was the last verse we saw in the first chapter. James introduced these examples for a particular reason of how we should submit ourselves to the perfect law that will set us free, that answers the question, what does authentic faith look like? As we move into the second chapter, James gives us more hands-on information for true believers. He gives us the basics of a Christian life. He dwells deeply into issues like partiality and prejudice which we will be studying today from verses 1 to 13 and faith and works 
from 14 to 26, which will be built in the next lessons. So the idea behind the letter what James is writing is, is transforming the readers from unclassified to a classified reader. In the sense, a classified reader or a believer is more like a distinct spiritual warrior. He builds our hearts and minds to become as spiritual warriors. In the sense, we become more mature. So based on this, we will be looking into James chapter 2 from verse 1 to 13. I will read from the New Living Translation. My dear brothers and sisters, how can we claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor person, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Is it the rich who oppress you and drag you into the court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law, as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said, you must not murder. So if you murder someone, but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say, or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. We have, we have seen in, in our Christian walk of life, we wrestle with a lot of external things. To most of us believers, we always, at times, or at always, come to immediate conclusions about people when we have a first look at them. If you could imagine, when we look at a person, we always either think about or look at the person's hair, it's too long, it's too shabby, it's too short. Or we look into people who come to the church and have our own impressions of how they dress. 
or by the cars they do come. If they come in a very expensive car, then we have a comment for that. If they come in a very old car, then we have a comment for that. If people live in a big house, we have an own comment for that. So the list goes on and ever and ever. This is what James is addressing it as prejudice. If you have an English Bible and if you have an NIV or an um, NIV translation, the title for this James second chapter, it, sta it states, favoritism forbidden. And in the New Living Translation, it says, a warning against prejudice. So the word prejudice comes from a Latin word which emphasizes prejudgment of someone. This causes an opinion among ourselves about somebody without any of the facts we do not know. So if you look into this whole section, James 2nd chapter, verses 1 to 13, for our understanding, we can break these sections so it's easy for us to understand. The very first verse in James 2 is the principle. That's what he wants to address, and that's what he writes very first. That's the principle. And from verse 2 to 4, he gives us an illustration. And from verse 5 to verse 11, he explains the reason why a prejudiced behavior is inconsistent with an authentic Christian faith. And he ends that chapter with verse 12 and 13 with an explanation. He's urging us to do the right thing. So the principle, the illustration, and the why question, why that doesn't fit into a Christian faith, and then finally, he ends up with an application. So we'll go into these, and we will finish this lesson. If you look into the very first verse, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people or brothers? So the very first verse is very, very clear here that he is addressing this verse or this letter to the Christian believers. The issue is not about their theology. It is not about what their belief system is. James is saying there is an issue in their attitude. There is an attitude of personal favoritism. As I said in the beginning, you see a person's outward appearance and receive that image as a real thing, which is not the way we should do it. If you look into Acts chapter 10, 34, Peter verses say, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. So God judges the truth of a matter by the heart, not by the face. And Christians are called to reflect this quality in our own lives. So partiality and prejudice can go in the direction. It can go either as a positive 
or as a negative thing. I can explain this by saying, by merely looking into a particular person, his outward characteristics, he can miss a lot of personal flaws from that person. Because when we look into that person, he might be wearing something very attractive, his language will be beautiful, and his mannerism is going to be wonderful. And these are the things that blinds our eyes. At the same time, we can too quickly condemn a person based on the outward appearance. We are failing to see the Christ-like character. So the main emphasis in the principle, what James is saying is, we should have the discernment. James isn't questioning the importance of wise character study, but we should all exercise the discernment. James is addressing the problem of prejudice, judgment made prior to any careful discernment. When I, when I say this, I also want to say a, a real story that happened here in Seattle. I do not remember the author of the book um, who wrote this real story in her uh, book, wherein she had invited one of her friends who was an non-believer who did not know anything about the Savior, the Messiah, the Church, nothing. And he was not always well-dressed. And this person was invited to the Church one day. And when this person showed up in the Church, he was not dressed according to the Church standards. He did not have a footwear. He had a torn jean and he had a t shirt. It was like crumpled, torn, and his hair was not done. So you can imagine how he was. And by the time he showed up in the church, the church was almost about to begin. And when he entered, he was not able to find any seat for him. And he just walked almost to the front, and he realized there wasn't any seat that he could sit. And then he finally sat right on the aisle in front of the pulpit. You can imagine what would have happened every other people on the bench, they started whispering among themselves about the behavior of this person. And at that moment, a very elderly deacon walks down the aisle towards this young gentleman. And everybody were whispering, come on, this, this deacon is just going to pull this guy out of the place. But you know, the opposite happened the elderly deacon stretched himself with difficulty and sat on the floor with that young gentleman. This is, this is what happens in a real life for a true believer. The reason I say this this for the following verses. When I say illustration, from verse 2 to 4. So here, James gives a totally different picture to his period. So what he says is, like, during those times when people used to gather in the synagogues, these Jewish Christians and the Jewish people 
the assembled in the synagogue even for a regular meeting or even during a sabbath time one thing we have to make sure is during the synagogue meetings the jewish christians were expelled from the synagogue by the regular jewish people because they did not like these jewish christians who embraced christ as the savior so there was always a friction between the jewish christians and the non believers so the emphasis here is as you read you can see like two men two men as they approach the church that is the synagogue one is richly clothed and he is a very influential person and at the same time there is also a poor person you should have seen here in most of the english uh, churches here in us there is always an usher in the church i used to do a ushering job in most of the churches i have attended the job for the usher is greet the people welcome the people who are coming to the church and then making them comfortable and finding them seats to sit on here lies the issue when a usher sees these two different people one a rich one a poor that person's true character comes out right at this moment how he receives these two people that's what he mentions james mentions in these two verses from 2 to 4 what happens is like when you do this of receiving these two different people how you treat them if you're blinded by the rich man's dresses you try to give that person a nice good place you can see that in matthew 23 6 which mention the chief seats in the synagogues the the before we go any further the chief seats in the synagogues are mostly occupied by rich and influential people the synagogue seating system is totally different from the churches what we attend to if you could imagine the same pattern of seating arrangement in a church but what happens in a synagogue is the pulpit is almost in the middle of the building the middle of the uh, seating arrangements on both sides of the pulpit are the chairs where people are arranged to sit so it's almost like a half circle system of seating arrangements and the pulpit is in the middle and all the men occupy these and the women and the children they sit in the balcony so what happens is the influential people are always made to sit in front of the pulpit this is what it happens here that the rich people they have their preferred places to be seated and then what happens is to the poor either he is made to stand over over outside or he is made to sit on the floor so the here the emphasis is more on the motive motive that always affects the behavior if that happens that's what when he ends in the fourth verse james says the usher is guilty of discrimination he says this kind of prejudice is a sin this kind of prejudice is a sin the reason he says sin is discrimination in god is totally unacceptable as we all know everyone before the eyes of the god are equal that is the reason james says this kind of discrimination is a sin when we move on to the illustration the why questions from verses 5 to 
what happens here is like when James is trying to explain why this prejudice and partiality are unfit for a believer, for which he gives three reasons: a theological reason, a logical reason, and a biblical reason. The theological reason he gives in verse five is God doesn't show any partiality. To explain this, we can turn to Second Corinthians chapter one and verse twenty six to Sorry, First Corinthians, not Second Corinthians. If I had said Second Corinthians, I'm sorry. Like it's First Corinthians, first chapter, verses twenty-six to twenty-nine. It says, "Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are were wise in world's eyes, or powerful or wealthy, when God called you." instead god chose the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise and he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful god chose things despised by the world things counted as nothing at all and used them to bring to nothing what the world considered important as a result no one can ever boast in the presence of god so the point here is when god doesn't show any partiality why do we want to show that same partiality to our own brother that's that's our theological reason he gives us and the second one is the logical reasons when that's in verses 6 to 7 when we look into this james is posting two questions two questions which reveal about the situation the very first one is the rich and powerful or persecuting the christians dragging them before the authorities that's what we see in verse 6 and then the second one is the rich and the powerful were blaspheming the christ name if you look into carefully the verses from 5 to 7 they are all questions is asking repeatedly certain questions to the readers hasn't god chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith aren't they the ones who inherit the kingdom god promised to those who loves them which is what we saw just now that's the theological reason right and then he shifts to the logical reason 6 and 7 but you the son of the poor isn't the rich people who oppress the poor and drag them into the court and aren't the rich one who blaspheme jesus christ see if you if you read carefully we can bring this illustration between these two ver- verses what we can understand here in this context is we can tell that the poor are not involved in this kind of persecution it's only the rich that's the reason james is pointing against the rich so discriminating and sh- showing favoritism towards the rich and mistreating the poor makes no sense at all one thing i have to be clear 
James is not questioning about a person being rich or poor. But do not discriminate the rich and the poor. That's that's the main emphasis here. And then he gives a biblical reasoning from verses 8 to 11. For this one, he says, if you turn to Leviticus, if you turn to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. Watch carefully. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. What does that say? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's a familiar verse, right? For most of us, it is a familiar verse. This is the one Jesus used in his teaching in Matthew 19.19. He was actually quoting this Old Testament, Leviticus, verse 19, verse 18. In fact, it's the basis for his golden rule, which is treat people the same way you want them to treat to you which is in Matthew 7, 12. Jesus Christ called this the second of the greatest commandments. The first one being to love God with all the heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Referring to this second great command, Paul says that every commandment in the law of Moses is summed up in this saying which we find in Romans 13, 9. If you, if, you turn to, if you turn to Romans 13 and verses 9, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Watch carefully. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law is fulfilled in one word in that statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The same verse, the same verse is given here in Galatians 5, 14. Galatians 5, 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. To break one law is like breaking all of them or vice versa. If you break any of the others, you have broken this law, what James is telling in James, um, chapter 2, verse 11. So for this reason, prejudice, which refuses to love all equally, transgress the great commandment. We will come to the final section where he says the application. Why don't you do it? So he wraps up the whole chapter of prejudice with an explanation by saying why don't you apply the teaching? What he says is like three important points. With these three important points we finish this study. He says let scripture be your standard. Let love be the law. And let mercy be your message. I'll repeat it again. Let 
scripture be your standard and let love be your law and let mercy be your message to speak and act the way we believers we do or we law breakers or are we subjecting to god's discipline we all know this verse by heart right like in romans 8:1 it says like there is no condemnation for those who are in jesus christ what james is revealing here to all of us is do not judge anybody do not judge anybody the the main emphasis what james saying is let us not show partiality or let us not show any favoritism especially in the churches we go that's a holy holy place where we go and seek him and let us not find a discrimination among believers by the way they dress by the car they come or by their education standards or anything else let us not have any prejudice or let us not have any partiality this will also include in the workplaces too in every place we go let us not have any favoritism let us not judge any other person either by their looks god doesn't judge us by our outward looks you know how david was chosen david was not chosen by any of the external outlooks that's the reason i end up this study by saying let the scriptures be your standards and it is not our habits favoritism doesn't mix with jesus whatever be your race whatever be your color we are all equal among christ and the second one i told you was let love be your law and mercy be your message but again i want to close this by saying these questions we need to ask god how best can i love a person by our words and actions in our workplace in our church you don't want to get away from people i have done that in the past but i have repented and i have turned back and i presume that you will also do the same thing you might have somebody in your workplace in your church for some reason you have got a hatred or you have got a favoritism either by rejecting that person or avoiding that person let this moment be the time that you want to build up a relationship ask god to reveal where you may be guilty of favoritism and partiality showing partiality and at the same time ask for the discernment to make good distinctions about how to love whom to trust and when to comfort 
we looked into all these things james isn't saying we must treat every other person on the soul exactly the same he isn't saying that we must treat every soul on this earth exactly the same but we can't treat people unfairly based on our prejudices when we approach a person when we meet a person take that opportunity to demonstrate the love god has shown us put away the prejudice put away the partialities you remember when jesus lived on this earth he met zacchaeus whom everybody hated but jesus in spite of all those things whatever was happening around him he went and dined in his place he did not show any partiality he did not show any partiality to any one of us he has accepted each and every one of us as we are we have sinned against him and against the father no big sin no small sin a sin of sin but still when we professed our faith when we repented of our sins he accepted us into his family we became hires and co-hires we got the utmost relationship of calling him father abba he did not show any partiality to us our lord thank you for all this wonderful words lord thank you for accepting us you have wiped away our sins it is white as snow all the crimson red is all gone lord you did not show any favoritism you did not show any prejudice thinking lord you accepted us people as who we are you mended us you molded us and you still do this lord because still we are imperfect thank you for the transformation you are bringing us lord into the image of your son jesus christ you mend us you mold us you chisel away the sinful things that are happening in our places our thoughts our actions our speech let us always reflect Christ Jesus let us always be salt and light shaking and shining in the places where we work the places where we go and let us always be witnesses lord let us always boldly proclaim your truth and when on the judgment day let us stand boldly and with confidence 
saying like we have done the commission that you gave us lord bless each one of us bless each one of the listeners who are going to listen this message in the future talk to them lord give us a clean heart with a clear thinking with a better discernment with a good judgment lord that we need to live in the sinful place thank you for being with us delivering this truth to us in the name of our lord jesus christ amen amen amen